regret it. Indulge. Ask yourself, when was the last time you were truly happy? If you ask me how I'm doing, I'm feeling peppy, sprightly, spry, I'm good, 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 getting by. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is easily the best show to have ever aired on the CW channel. And honestly, one of the best shows out there in general. Yeah, that's right. I said it. I don't even know where to start with this show. It's really just so brilliant in so many different ways. If you've never heard of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, though, let me give you the base concept. Rebecca Bunch is a lawyer from New York City who is absolutely miserable. In a... Well, actually, wait. Uh, the season one theme song pretty much summarizes all of this. I was working hard at a New York job in the open navy blue. One day I was trying a lot, and so I decided to move to West Covina, California. Brand new pals and new career. It happens to be what Josh list, but that's not why I'm here. She's the crazy ex girlfriend. That's a sexist term. She's the crazy ex girlfriend. Can you guys stop singing for just a second? She's so broken inside. The situation's a lot more nuanced than that. Oh, and let me fill you in with one other small detail you might find interesting. It's a fucking musical. West Covina. <clears throat> oh, didn't mean to play that last one, but hey, might as well use this clip as a segue into a brief exploration on how fucking progressive this show is. Words cannot express how revolutionary this show is. Like, yeah, period sex is a gross song, but one, that's kind of the point, and two, how fucking groundbreaking is it for a show to actually talk about women's health like this? The show talks about topics that are normally pretty taboo for network television, which, I mean, honestly, the fact that it's taboo in the first place is, is really dumb. Like, guess what? Menstruation is a fucking regular thing for, like, 50% of people. Why is it so taboo to mention on TV? Oh, wait. I can tell you why. Because the majority of broadcast television is designed specifically for the male gaze, and the shows that are actually aimed at women are usually specifically cashing in on the preteen girl demographic, which is a whole nother can of toxic worms to unpack another day. Now, I'm not saying that Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is a show that can only be watched by women. After all, I'm a cisgender male who fucking adores the series. But what I am saying is that it's really damn refreshing to see a show that isn't ashamed to talk about these issues and doesn't specifically pander towards a certain demographic, you know, like 85% of the other TV material out there. Yes, I just spent quite a bit of time talking about menstruation. Uh... <laughs> D don't question it. But seriously, the show is just so refreshing with these things. Like, even from the first episode, the show doesn't feel the need to coat every actress with makeup to glamorize them for the screen. This is just what human beings look like. Why is this so rare to see in media? Almost every character on the show looks like a normal fucking person. Like, these all look like people that you would actually see in real life. Not everyone's some unrealistic stud and... That's fucking awesome. In fact, the entire sexy getting ready song in the first episode it really is just a brilliant way of showing the kind of gross truth of making yourself look good. Cause boy, I know you like an hourglass silhouette. The show, of course, also has some of the best LGBT representation out there, in my opinion. Like, the entire song Getting By is just a love letter to the bisexual community, and I fucking adore it. Are oh, you just gay? Why don't you just go get me on the way? Cause pie's legit. Whether you're a he or a she, we might be a perfect fit. I don't care if you wear high heels or a tie. You might just catch my eye because I'm definitely bi. Being bi does not imply that you're a player or a slut. Oh yeah, I'm letting my Choosing to make Daryl of all people bisexual was just so fucking refreshing because in most recent television, bisexual characters tend to only be younger women who 
are then over-sexualized once again by that dreaded male gaze. Having this sung by a middle-aged single dad is just so fucking smart on behalf of the show's creators, and that's really the only actual coming out scene in the series, because it was kind of necessary for Daryl's character growth in the second half of the first season. Later on in the show, certain characters legit just date people of the same gender without even addressing it, and that's fucking awesome. The representation of sexuality in the show is just so beautiful because it treats these same-sex relationships like normal fucking relationships, which in my opinion is so much better than the blatant and unnatural ways that shows like Riverdale try to incorporate same-sex relations. Daryl and White Josh are actually such a great fucking couple, like holy shit, they're so cute together, and I fucking love this show for doing such a good job with pairings like these. In terms of the bass music itself, the show constantly shows off its ability to nail any genre of music, giving us countless pastiches to other artists, such as Megan Trainer. My sperm, my sperm, the chest have all confirmed. ABBA, or, or, uh, ABBA, uh, the, you know, the Mamma Mia people, you know who they are. The first penis I saw, first penis, very first penis. And musicals, such as Les Miserables. I she didn't come and dear evan hansen what's at the end please don't make me say this of this rainbow but these are all just tiny pieces of what make the show great after all this show is the story of rebecca nora nope. uh -uh. the titular crazy ex-girlfriend herself <laughs> she's a crazy ex-girlfriend what no, she's not. She's a crazy ex-girlfriend. That's a sexist term, Scott. She's a crazy ex-girlfriend. Okay, just stop talking for a second. She's so broken inside. Now, I will be discussing the actual plot of the show from here on out, so if you're really gung-ho about avoiding any spoilers, then you may want to leave. However, most of the plot points in the show, specifically relating to mental illness, actually make the initial viewing even better when knowing them beforehand, in my experience. So I'd still recommend sticking around. I'll let you know before I discuss any actual super heavy spoilers. Rebecca Bunch is one of the most well-written characters in television history. Who is she? She's funky, she's sweet, a generous friend. Oh, but there she looks kind of mean. Hmm, okay, she's snarky, sarcastic, and a what you know we're not really seeing a common thing. <laughs> no, but in reality, she's just a person. A realistic person who makes mistakes just like the rest of us. The specific thing worth noting, however, is that as the show goes on, it becomes known that she actually has BPD, otherwise known as Borderline Personality Disorder. And let me just say, I was absolutely floored by how realistic the portrayal of BPD was in the show. Like, it's fucking raw and painful to watch at times because of how fucking accurate everything is. I don't personally have BPD myself, but I've known multiple people that do, and it was almost scary how realistic the show's portrayal of the disorder was, especially in the second half of the show. No, I get it. You hate everything, and you hate this place. It's making you miserable, so I'm making you miserable, and I'm an idiot. This was a stupid idea, so let's just go. Let's just go. Now that clip I just played was from season 4 and I think serves as a very good starting point to talk about how Rebecca's BPD is ultimately the crux of the entire series. As mentioned earlier, this show is a musical. I love how I'm saying that, like you could somehow forget that after I just showed you like 15 fucking different clips from the musical numbers, but the real question is, what exactly are these musical numbers? Are they happening within the universe? Are they in Rebecca's head? Are they just representations of the inner thoughts of the characters? Are they just regular dialogue exchanges put to music? The answer to all of this is yes. It's a bit complicated because technically you could say that all of these answers really are correct. Let's first talk about the bulk of the songs though, which are from Rebecca's perspective and are essentially representations of her own internal thought process. Rebecca. Ooh, hello. Oh, I get it. You're doing that thing that you do. Right. Let's take the first song of the entire series. West Covina. Right in the middle of a mental breakdown, Rebecca runs into Josh, some guy that she dated at a summer camp back in high school. She finds out that he's living in West Covina, some random fucking town in California. She was just offered this promotion that she's been waiting for, so why isn't she happy? 
This is great. I'm so happy. Mom's gonna be so happy. This is what happy feels like. Happily just feels great and amazing. This is definitely what happy feels like. What's wrong with you? This is what happy feels like. It's now that she decides to make a very, very impulsive decision, prompting her first dissociative episode of the series. She begins to fantasize about this town of West Covina and how great it'll be for her. She can find happiness there. We can see a stark difference between her view of NYC versus West Covina. Everyone in New York is clearly very judgmental towards her, whereas in West Covina, no one seems thrown off by her musical number. Now, as we learn, none of Rebecca's musical numbers take place in reality, so these reactions are, in fact, just something that she's specifically imagining. None of you exist. But that can't be true. I have feelings. I have memories. <laughs> no, you don't. I just have an active fantasy life. I created you and I can destroy you. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the show, you may be wondering, how exactly do we know for sure that every single one of Rebecca's musical numbers are in her imagination? The answer to that is found in season four, where we find out that in reality, she can't actually sing for shit. Endless, incredible instant. I was harmonizing. So basically any musical number where she's actually singing is confirmed to not be real. BAM! Facts and logic. But moving back to West Covina itself as a musical number. And also by coincidence, Josh just happens to be here. This leaves us with a question. She moved here for Josh, right? But wh what about Josh is so great? They dated for like a month in high school, and he seems like, uh, well the worst? So why would she move here for him? As season one progresses and Rebecca's asked this question by Josh himself, this is the answer she gives. I was miserable in New York and then I ran into you, Josh, and, and you told me about West Covina and, and you kept using the word happy. I had to be where the happiness was, so I put feelers out and I got a job here. And honestly, it actually makes sense in the moment. I can vibe with that. It really... I love him so much. I moved here for you. What? Yeah, she basically admits to lying like 30 seconds later. So she did move here for Josh, but why? Why, why, why? This is the question, and as the show goes on, we can begin to decipher this puzzle. Rebecca did move to West Covina for Josh, but not for him as a person. She moved to West Covina because in this moment, when she was questioning why she wasn't happy, Josh served as a reminder of the time in her life when she was happy. For her, that summer with Josh was one of the greatest periods of time in her life, and in this moment, this inciting incident, if you will, she wants Josh because she wants happiness, and that's what he represents in her mind. I mean, really, the first half of this show is all centered around her understanding the reasoning behind this impulse decision. The second I saw you on the street in New York, I knew. I, I, I just knew you were the answer to all my problems. So anyway, that was a total major detour from the topic of musical numbers in the show. Sorry, this is all over the place, but just like life, my videos don't make narrative sense. So most of the musical numbers in this show take place in Rebecca's head, but let's talk about the exceptions to this rule. Firstly, talking about which musical numbers do actually happen in-universe and would be considered diegetic. All of Rebecca's numbers are, of course, non-diegetic, but there are, in fact, some diegetic numbers throughout the series as well, though it's hard to definitively prove prove some of them, so it's a bit speculative. Obviously, all the songs from the play in season four are diegetic, but then we have a song like Greg's I Gave You a UTI. My penis is the reason you may die, die, die. I gave you a UTI. I think this one's actually diegetic, just with a little extra backing music, courtesy of Rebecca's imagination. The way he actually plays the pots and pans like a drum set and his overall attitude in the scene making sense, given his manic behavior in the episode, makes me feel like this actually happens in universe. A slightly more questionable one is Daryl's song, You're My Best Friend and I Know I'm Not Yours. The backing music in this scene is almost entirely from his ukulele and the way that the scene plays out seems like it takes place fully in reality so I feel like it's diegetic, but I think it's important to focus back on the non-diegetic numbers for just a moment. Because again, they're mostly from Rebecca's perspective, but as we learn more and more, especially once we find out that she has BPD, her perspective of things is very skewed and not representative of what's actually happening. A prime example of this is the song Settle For Me in Season 1. Demeaning terms are all that I have left of my mess. 
masculinity so settle for me when greg asks rebecca out very very early on in the show this is the way that she sees that whole conversation go down greg asking her to just settle for him over josh swallowing his pride the whole shebang however once they actually do go out we get this little moment and your whole settle for me vibe like it's weird and sad okay well that's not quite how i remembered it i i don't want you to settle for me i <laughs> the entire scene of settle for me was just rebecca's perspective and not at all how it actually happened I think an even better example is another Greg song, this one sung by the recasted Greg, played by Skylar Aston, titled simply, I Hate Everything But You. I hate when people post pictures with the hashtag mood. I hate when people call blueberries a superfood. The way Rebecca perceives this conversation is basically just Greg talking about how much he hates everything for like three minutes straight with a couple of lines thrown in about how she's the one thing that he doesn't hate. After the song ends, we get this interaction that I played a little earlier in the video. Did that not work? You hate everything and you hate this place. It's making you miserable. So I'm making you miserable and I'm an idiot. This was a stupid idea. So let's just go. Clearly, Greg said something completely different to what she interpreted, but at this point, she's been skipping group therapy and ignoring her treatment and basically relapsing. So she yeets right on out of there. And I think that using these musical numbers like this is actually a fucking perfect way to visually display the mistaken interpretations of events that people with BPD commonly have. Uh, essentially, like their brain is going out of its way to deceive them. That's something very difficult to have to overcome, and from what I've seen, the show's portrayal of BPD has actually been very empowering to those that actually do suffer from the disorder. We also very often see Rebecca's self-hatred represented in these musical numbers as well. on you bitch you'll never be free you're still a poopy little slut who lives in a dream and doesn't know how to love okay here's the final thing i want to touch on in regards to the show's musical numbers i'm imagining myself in a musical number that's how i sometimes see big moments in my life and because i do that so does the show the thing is rebecca isn't present for many of the songs in the show Hot guys have problems too. Hold on, are you are you actually here? Like in reality? Yeah. You wanna join our imaginary song and dance? Sure. And we don't actually have an answer for how this works, unfortunately. It's, it's really all speculation. I think the most likely answer is that these numbers are just representations of what these characters are truly thinking, just viewed through this musical lens, uh, just like Rebecca would see it. The show presents antidepressants in a really interesting way as well. Of course, there's the song Antidepressants Are So Not A Big Deal, which talks about how basically everyone's on antidepressants and we shouldn't be ashamed of it, made even better by how it's stylized to resemble the song in La La Land. Fluoxetine, fluoxetine, peroxetine, peroxetine, citalopram, citalopram. But before the song, Rebecca has had a really bad experience with antidepressants, as I feel many of us have in the past. Jumping back all the way to episode one, she's on antidepressants, and it makes her feel like a robot. This is one of the factors in the absolute misery that she feels in New York. She just feels nothing, and she hates it. She dumps all of her meds as soon as she gets to West Covina, but when she starts to feel negative thoughts again as season one progresses, she's desperate to take those same meds again to numb herself. She literally takes a random pill that she finds on the floor of the therapy office. Jesus, fuck. All right, I think the last thing I want to talk about before getting into the heavier spoilers is some of the more delusional episodes that Rebecca suffers from. Throughout the series, she consistently throws herself into the high of a relationship. She thinks that when she's in a relationship, she's fine. She's safe. And as such, when in a relationship or pining after someone, she consistently ignores her therapy and treatment. When she and Greg get into a fight in season four, she tries jumping back to Nathaniel and Josh to try to feel happy. Season two. Leading up to the big wedding, this is when she struggles the most. She has the same fears and panic attacks that she had in New York. This is what happy feels like. 
And so she keeps trying to find ways to make herself happy because that's ultimately her greatest desire. That's what she wants. So she moves her wedding up to be only two weeks away and lies about her reason why to even Paula, her best friend and partner in crime. Finally, once her dad shows back up and things seem to be going somewhat all right, she falls into her most delusional episode by far. She ignores all the very serious red flags and fully believes that everything is going to be perfect as she sings this medley of reprises. It's easily the most delusional sequence of the entire series, in my opinion. The saddest part is how happy she is, despite how absolutely devastatingly sad this development is. I'll never have problems again. All right, we shall now be heading into what I deem the spoiler zone, talking about some of the bigger and more important plot elements that those of you who haven't seen the series may want to be wary of. So to skip spoilers, just head over to the timestamp shown on screen now. So, season three. Motherfucker, this shit destroyed me. Like, l let me tell you, the moment that Rebecca's mom opens her laptop to find that the website she's been looking at was the nine least painful ways to kill yourself, I... <sighs> wow. Holy shit, that fucking broke me. God, I mean, it almost seemed like she was trying to kill herself back in the season two finale, but in season three, she she really does go through with a, uh, with a suicide attempt. She leaves her mom a suicide note and overdoses on her flight. I, I've never before seen such a, a, a painfully accurate portrayal of suicide attempts on television. It physically hurt to watch, and yes, it made me cry. Now, this comes directly after another legitimate masterpiece the show produced when Rebecca imagines herself in a horror movie, after she admits that she doesn't even care what happens to herself. As she's been saying since season one, I'm the villain in my own story. She considers herself a villain, or in this case, a horror monster to all of her friends. So she basically acts like the villain of a horror movie and torments Josh. This is one of her massive relapses in the show and it makes Josh genuinely believe that she's a psycho. The worst part is the ending where she finds out that Greg is finally happy now that he's away from her. This all leads up to the start of the very lowest period of her life when she sleeps with Greg's dad. If you saw a movie that was like real life, you'd be like, what the hell was that movie about? This leads us back to the suicide attempt, continuing in this dark period for Rebecca. The craziest part is how this was set up from literally episode fucking one. I called my dad on his honeymoon in the Bahamas and I told him I was having suicidal thoughts, so ta-da, here I am. I hope this isn't another stunt like your little suicide attempt in law school. However, we actually see Rebecca's mom in this episode show that she truly does care for Rebecca, but it's very complicated for sure. Once she discovers Rebecca's intentions, everything she does, she does to try and help Rebecca here. Her attitude changes and she actively gives Rebecca these shakes, despite the constant fat shaming from her in Rebecca's youth. However, these shakes do turn out to contain some sort of antidepressant in them. So basically her mom was drugging her. These characters are flawed. Yes, her mother loves her. Yes, this is an absolutely horrible thing to do. It's not a contradiction. Her mother was trying to help Rebecca in the best way she knew how, which also doubled as a terrible, awful thing to do. I think that's also why she tries to call Rebecca's suicide attempts ploys for attention and such. It's very much the wrong thing to say, and a very terrible thing to say at that, but I assume from her perspective it's a method of trying to make Rebecca avoid attempting it again. It's not a good decision, but it's a human decision. I kind of just want to go back to sleep forever. This shit fucking hurts. It, it, it does. It really does. And seeing Nathaniel's reaction to all of it is also genuinely heartbreaking. And it becomes even worse when he has the revelation that his mother had tried killing herself when he was a child. Basically, these episodes just made me cry a fucking lot. She then gets diagnosed with BPD. A person with BPD is essentially someone who has difficulty regulating their emotions. Someone that lacks the 
protective emotional skin to feel comfortable in the world. And I liked the touch they added when the doctor tells her to not look at anything about BPD on the internet before her appointment, which she then ignores, giving herself a panic attack. Just really fucking accurate stuff. God damn. We also find out that the season 3 theme song is actually something she imagines while on the toilet very shortly after both her suicide attempt and her BPD diagnosis. She's processing her diagnosis by imagining herself in various music videos. The craziest theme song related reveal on the show, however, is at the end of season two, where we find out what inspired Rebecca to imagine the season two theme song. It turns out that she had an affair with a married professor at Harvard, and when he admitted to basically just fucking with her, she burned down his house, and this is how the court case went down. I'm just a girl in love. Your Honor, she's just a girl in love. I can't be held responsible for my actions. She's she can't be held responsible for her actions. I have no underlying issues to address. I'm certifiably cute and adorably obsessed. But I don't need help. I have no underlying issues to address. She was, in fact, in a mental institution prior to the start of the show, making lines like this. I mean, okay, no, I'm no, crazy, all right, I'm crazy. This is going down I'm crazy and I'm irrational and I'm everything not, my mother said. Okay. All the more impactful. All right, let's bounce to the end of the show. Who is she going to end up with? Josh? Greg? Nathaniel? I think we all predicted it, but the show still makes her lack of a choice really work thematically and actually function as a very satisfying end overall. It won't be ending up with someone, because romantic love is not an ending. It's just a, a part of your story. She decides to pursue musical theater as a career, since literally throughout the entire series, she's imagined everything as a musical. This is what everything has been building up to. She's been hiding this part of herself because of her embarrassment over it, but it was actually a, a truly beautiful thing. The show ends with her as she begins to play her first ever song, and it's beautiful. The most hidden part of herself was the key to the happiness that she desired all along. All right, let's talk about Trent and how while the show is super feminist, it also manages to be super anti-feminist simultaneously. Now, obviously songs like Let's Generalize About Men are very clearly poking fun at feminism. That's pretty hard to miss. Let's take one bad thing about one man and apply it to all of them. But Trent is a character that exists for the purpose of showing the inherent dismissal of Rebecca's behavior due to her being a woman. Trent is Rebecca graduated from a fancy college, works at a super well-paying job, and is just a boy in a la 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 I can't be held responsible for my actions. A male ingenue. I have no underlying issues to address. I'm certifiably cute and adorably obsessed. They say love makes you crazy, therefore you can't call him crazy. Because when you call him crazy, you're just calling him in love. Blam! I said blam. Yeah, I heard you. The show isn't exactly super subtle with Trent being a copy of Rebecca, as all of his short musical numbers are just reprises of her songs. Trent's getting ready. The trend is getting ready. Ah, oh, crap. Back. Period. Set. Nope, you don't get to sing that. Trent is fucking creepy. His stalker and blackmailing behavior towards Rebecca is fucking disturbing, and he is very obviously absolutely disgusting. But wait, Rebecca does all of these things. We dismiss that behavior because of her gender and some of the inherent sexism that we've been raised to believe without question. Trent's always got the best moments of the show because he helps remind us as the audience and Rebecca herself as a character that she's not doing the right thing. She can't use the excuse of doing it for love. This is fucked up behavior and that's why she needs to grow as a person. Okay, last thing before I close out this terribly paced and formulated video. Fucking Nathaniel! Oh my lord! Rebecca definitely should have ended up with him. I'm just saying, okay? Like, let's compare him at the start of the show. Just super quickly have intercourse. You could use the exercise. To him towards the end. She practically raised me. If I needed somebody, she was there. And the very next person to love me like that was Rebecca. And now they're gone. And they're both gone. The people I cared about most of my life are gone. He's also very easily the least toxic out of Rebecca's relationships and actually actively improved because of Rebecca. So yeah, I just kind of wanted to vent my appreciation for this ship. 
All right, but seriously, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is a masterpiece of a show that provides one of the most fulfilling viewing experiences ever by giving us an intimate look at a very personal struggle Rebecca is facing with her disorder. The show is never about Josh. It was always about mental health. Oh my god, I think I like you. Oh my god, I think I like you. It's scary, but you sent me back on my heel.